1 Timothy, um, in 1 Timothy chapter 5. We're looking at the church, and we're looking at the, 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 the call of the church, the responsibilities of the church, and, and how we are to conduct ourselves within the church. And this evening, again, we're continuing to look at the care of widows, which is the, one of the first things he's dealing with when it comes to, uh, he actually starts off talking about uh, discipline, really. Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him. He's talking about problems that are in the church and how to deal with them, and he starts with how we are to look at and to, to um, work with widows in the church. And so this evening, uh, I'll just read um, through verse 9. I had hoped, well, we'll go through verse 10. But I had hoped to go further, but it's not going to happen. So, um, 1 Timothy chapter 5, Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters with all purity. Honor widows who are really widows. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents for this is good and acceptable before, the, before God. Now she who is really a widow and left alone trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. And these things command that they may be blameless. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number, and not unless she has been the wife of one man, well reported for good works, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. And with that, we'll end our reading, and let's come before God and ask his blessing on his word. Father, again, um, having read your holy, infallible, and inspired word, and, and, and we know, Lord, again, that uh, uh, these words seem to be simple, and, and some of them are simple, and, but others of them point to a depth. And, and there's a depth of understanding here about the church. So, Father, we pray um, that your spirit would be with my mouth, that you'd bring forth uh, a, a good word. Uh, for, Lord, only you, you can do that. Uh, all of us men in our, in our flesh are fools, and we have nothing of ourselves to offer uh, but take the, the little thing that has been prepared and make it something that um, will sustain, strengthen, and encourage your people and be with each one here present. Uphold them, keep them, bless them in your word, your spirit, your truth. And, and again, Father, we pray too for those that do not yet know you as Lord and Savior, have mercy. Open their hearts and uh, may it be that they would come to see and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior alone. All these things. Uh, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, the last couple of weeks ago, we began looking at this text uh, about widows and how we are to care for widows. And, and one of the things that we saw is that care, caring for widows is far more than one small aspect of the church. In a way, and I, and I, and I believe this is why uh, the Apostle Paul is putting this first, in a way, Caring for widows is representative of what the church is called to be. Um, it's representative of all that the church is, is called to be. In James 1, verse 27, we read this. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. A, a church... A congregation that does not have the care of widows at the forefront of their mission in this world, brothers and sisters, is a church that does not know Christ well, and that's all there is to it. Widows are representative of all the marginalized, and, and remember I explained that word, marginalized, just a fancy word for meaning on the margins, on the far edges of society. Uh, the people that don't have a family, the people that don't have a voice, and, and so widows are are part of that, the representative of that, of that community, the widow, the fatherless, the stranger, those that don't have families, those that don't have anyone to stand up and speak for them. And, and these are those for whom God has a special consideration for. In fact, in the Old Testament law, I'll remind us again, uh, Exodus chapter 22, verses 22 and 23, you shall not afflict any widow or fatherless children, 
or fatherless child, if you afflict them in any way, and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will become hot. It is by God's design that women are to be protected, to be provided, and to be cared for by their fathers and by their husbands. And when they lose that protection, God becomes their unique protector. God's word in the Old Testament law touched on a major problem or an issue not just in uh, Israel, not just in the Middle East, but literally in the whole world, over the length and breadth of the entire world. Wherever humans lived and gathered together as communities and societies, widows, the fatherless, the stranger, all these who were on the, on the, on the far edges, on the margins of society, um, every community had them. No matter where you went, no matter what religion these people had, there were always these marginalized people on the outside. And they were always in need. And we can understand why. Life was very hard. You know, again, I say this and I'm going to keep saying it because I think it's very important that we as Americans understand this. We live in a time, in a world, in a place that most of the world has never seen. Most people in America live at a level that is so high compared to the average human being over the, over the length and the span of the, of the history of this earth. Uh, most people have been poor, and even like today, there are plenty, there are literally tens, hundreds of millions of poor people that would understand you could throw them back a thousand years and it would not be a whole lot different than what they're experiencing now. But not here. Here, we have the best of the best in so many ways. And so life was very hard for the majority of people all over, uh, all through the history of the world. And if men are working from dawn to dusk, literally just to get enough food to care for their families, just enough clothing to care for their families, um, it's logical, and this is human reason, it's logical that adding somebody else to that, you know, going to those margins and finding that widow that needs some help, and, and inviting her in or helping to care for her would only make life more difficult. One more mouth to feed, one more person to provide for. But when the light of the gospel comes into the world, when Jesus Christ ascends the cross and dies and then is resurrected and ascends into heaven and pours out his Holy Spirit on the church, and now the gospel begins to go out, people begin to go forth and and the gospel really is a powerful thing, brothers and sisters, because it tells us to do something against all logic and all reason. He tells us that if you trust in me and if you believe in me and you do what I ask you to do, I'm going to give you all that you need, right? So if you look at your own income and your own situation and you say, ah, wow, we're just barely making it, but then you see somebody else over here that, that, that has a need, and there's a word in your heart that says, help this person out. Logically, reasonably, that does not make any sense to do it. But God says, just do it and see what happens. God says, trust me. And what we find in the church, brothers and sisters, is that when we begin to do what God calls us to do, even if it's against human logic and human reason, that we begin to experience blessing in our own lives and he begins to give us more than we've ever had before. And that's against logic, but that's what the church has done through the history of the world. So um, what happened, though, though, is that when the gospel began to go forth, through the light of the gospel, the name of Christ began to go out, and as the spirits poured out on the church, in city after city, in uh, nation after nation, wherever the gospel went, widows, the fatherless, and the stranger were welcomed and cared for as part of the family of God in Jesus Christ. But, and this is what our text is dealing with, humans being humans. After a while, there were many that began to take advantage of the generosity of the church. There were many who tried to exploit, to manipulate uh, the graciousness of Christ um, to the needy in the church. And this appears to be one of the many problems or issues that Timothy is dealing with at Ephesus, but it's not just at Ephesus. When Paul writes these, these letters, he's well aware that in many of the churches, they're experiencing the same problems, the same kind of issues. There were older widows 
that were serving at least semi-officially in the church, but their lives were not as upright as they should have been. There were younger widows breaking vows that they had made to Christ. There were women that were using their status as widows, going from household to household, spreading gossip. This is part of the reality of the church, right? The church is not filled with, you know, perfect people. It's filled with sinners. We're, we're broken people. And uh, so bottom line, there were widows that should be cared for by the church, uh, but there were also others that were indeed widows but should not have been under the full care of the church. And so the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is giving Timothy instruction on how to divide between them. And that's what we're, again, looking at this evening. And so um, there's a couple of principles here and then some, some uh, underlying or some, some commandments that flow out of those principles. Principle number one, the, the obligation to support widows. In verse 3, honor widows who are really widows. This is a command. The church has a responsibility to those widows that are really widows. And, and, and again, uh, brothers and sisters, we, we talked about the word widow. Widow does not mean necessarily that the husband is dead. Uh, it might have been a man that had two wives. And, and uh, in obedience to the scripture, he lets one of them go. And so here's a, here's a woman that was cared for and was in a home, and all of a sudden she's outside the home. Um, there are other situations where uh, a woman might become a Christian and a man uh, does not love, he, he hates the word of God, and the more that he's with his wife and, and, hears, and, and sees her you know, going to church and being uh, part of the family of Christ, he gets angry and angry, and, 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 you know, in 1 Corinthians 7, it talks about that. He just leaves, just abandons her, right? And, and so here she is now without, without care. Um, so there's an obligation to support widows, and it doesn't mean just uh, a, a woman whose husband is dead. It means a woman who is alone, bereft, without anyone to care for her or to watch for her. And, and so um, the first principle is that the church has an obligation to widows that are truly widows. Second of all, the, the, the church has an obligation to evaluate the widows who need support. And, and again, I think this is always kind of gets us into some gray areas that we have to be careful of. Uh, it's been my experience and, and from what I've seen in, in, in many churches, like especially in the Dutch Reformed churches over the last 150 years, um, we can get very stingy with people and we can try to use these things to to tighten things up so much and 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 um to actually you know i i i i've got a brother-in-law who told me that when he was a young young deacon in, in a congregation i mean some woman needed help and, and and they went to their house and they're looking through her checkbook they're looking through her drawers i mean it was just the woman was in tears when they left and of course, now he knows what a foolish and harsh thing that was. But he had been instructed by people that were telling him, you got to really check, you got to really look. That's not what Paul's doing. But Paul is saying that there are lines here that we need to observe. All right, so the church has an obligation to evaluate these widows. So in verse 5, now she who is really a widow, okay, and and. Widows with sons and daughters are to be cared for by them, okay? And, and so we see that in verse 4. We also will see it in verse 8, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show piety at home and to repay their parents. What it's saying is that a widow who is really a widow, a woman is really bereft and alone, is not someone who has sons and daughters that have households that could take them in or care for them. And, and so that's a, that, that's a big uh, command or principle that's coming out of there. Widows with sons and daughters are to be cared for by them. The first line of responsibility is the physical family. She who is really a widow in the eyes of the church, how do we define that? Um, she is desolate. She is someone who's alone. She has no one to care for her. That's part of this evaluation. Um, her hope is is fixed or anchored in God. Uh, we see that uh, in verse 5. She trusts in God. And the word there is that her hope, that, that it, it's actually the word um, that she, her, her hope is fixed in God. It's, it's actually like she is anchored to God. And she is a woman who is praying, uh, making supplications and praying night and day. She's a Christian. The, 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 the widow 
that's alone, the woman who's alone and bereft, the woman who is a Christian, and, and what we're talking about, uh, there's a difference here. Uh, make no mistake. The church has a solid responsibility and calling from God to care for certain people. The church is able and can care and can give and can be generous to others on top of this. But this is what we are called to do. This is a command. There's no choice in this as church. So that doesn't mean that someone over here that, you know, maybe there's a widow down the street and there's somebody that's in trouble, but she's not a Christian. But as church, you look at her and you say, you know what? She needs to experience the gospel. Let's, let's help her out because we know from neighbors, et cetera, that she's having a hard time of it, a hard go of it. The church has every uh, right to actually, you know, share the gospel by being good to her and, 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 and helping her out. But we have, we don't have the fixed responsibility to do that. We have a fixed responsibility to these ladies, someone who is alone, someone who does not have a family, someone who is a Christian. Uh, she's a godly woman praising and petitioning God in prayer. For a woman who cannot work, uh, brothers and sisters, someone, you know, because that, especially in the ancient world, and especially a lot of times we're talking about older ladies, they can't just go out and get a job. But a Christian lady that's receiving help from the church, who's praying for the church, who's caring for the church, is actually offering something back. And, and, and that comes up again a little bit later. So we'll get back into that a little bit later. But... Um, this is actually a woman who's defined as a, as a true widow. She's part of the church, and she cares, and she's in prayer, and she's trusting in the Lord um, for her support. So that's a, that's a positive evaluation. Negative, negatively, when we look at these evalu how we evaluate things, there's a negative way, too. Um, negatively, the church does not have an obligation toward Verse 6, the woman whose husband has died and is now living a life dedicated to her own pleasure, but she who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. You know, this is kind of hard for us to imagine because our world is so different today, and it's because of the gospel. You know, the freedom that women have, the, the, uh, all the options that women have come because of a nation that once was founded on the gospel. That's why women have the kind of freedom in this country that, they've, that they have. But that has not always been so. Most women were, were completely under the authority of their fathers. And then many times they were married away when they were 11, 12, 13 years old. And, uh, you know, so then they're under the authority of their husband. A lot of times those husbands did not know uh, how to care for their women, and especially a young woman like that, just, it, it was brutal. Many, many women, I've read a lot of different stuff about this, uh, a, a lot of these young women, too, would get very bitter and angry because of the pain that was inflicted upon them, and just a lot of different things. But anyway, so their husband, um, so if their husband dies, and all of a sudden, for the first time in their life, they're free, or at least, you know, it's kind of like a college student, you know, you're free of mom and dad, and it's like, I have no authority over me, and now they're just living for themselves. The apostle says, no. The, the church does not have an obligation to, to, to take care of someone who's not living unto Christ, that's not living a godly life. And, and so negatively, that woman's not included. Uh, verse 7, the entire church is to apply these evaluations as commands. They're, they're commands from, and these things command that they may be blameless. And, and who's the they there? Well, he's talking about uh, not the widows so much, but he's talking about families. He's talking about families that have obligations to take care of, of widows or, or uh, a widowed aunt, um, a grandmother, a mother, etc. Someone that's in your, your family the, the primary responsibility falls on the family. And, and we'll get into that a little bit more in, in this next verse here, in verse 8. So verse 8 is a, is a, is a negative restatement of, of verse 4, right? So in verse 4, it's telling you if you have children or grandchildren, um, 
that the widow is to be cared for by them. And so it says it in a positive way, right? Uh, this is piety, this is good and acceptable before the Lord. In verse eight, it's, it's kind of a summation, but it's a negative summation. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So he, the Apostle Paul is commanding and he's telling families that, look, the, the, the primary uh, family unit that God has created, a husband and a wife and, and sons and daughters, they have the primary responsibility, the physical responsibility of care for their own family, for their own. Look at what it says there. If anyone does not provide for his own, that's kind of a very vague and general. And, and what it means, you know, because look at how it says it. Uh, does not provide for his own and especially for those of his, his household. So you have your household, you have your wife and your children, um, but your own expands beyond that, doesn't it? Uh, I've got brothers and sisters. They've got wives. They've got children. And, and I've got aunts and uncles, etc. And so if there's someone that's of my own, of my own flesh and blood, the Word of God is telling us that we have a primary responsibility to our own, not just our own particular unit, but beyond. And, and, and so, and, and you see what he's doing. He's, he's actually showing us how the world was designed to be. The world was designed that the family, that's the, that's the core unit that cares for the family. And so the church is a family too, but it doesn't come in primary, it comes in secondary, it comes in behind the physical family. The man of the family who does not care for his own flesh, his own, has denied the faith. That's a hard statement. And, and what it means is that the church of God, Jesus Christ does not do away with the family. It affirms the physical family in the most powerful way and then expands the family. Love one another as I have loved you. So think about what the, what, what the Apostle Paul, he's denied the faith. What does that mean? How could you possibly love and care for your fellow members of the church and at the same time deny your widowed mother the love and care that she should receive from you? Right? So you're a member of a church and you're an upstanding member and, and then people find out, you know, they hear you talking every now and then and the only time you mention your parents is in a negative way. Yeah, they're not Christians. They're there, you know, and, and whatever. It, one thing after another. Um, and it's always negative. And then they find out your, your parents are actually pretty nice people, but they're in need, but you don't want to take care of them. So how as a member of the, your church, your congregation, how are we supposed to trust you? If you won't take care of your own, your own flesh and blood, the people that you grew up with, the, the people that, that helped you and cared for you, if you won't care for them, why would I think that you're going to care for me? Right? You've denied the faith. Right? If you can't even love your own, your own family, your own physical family, that, that's part of your flesh and part of your bone and part of your blood. You're not going to love us. That's what he means. You're denying the faith. It's literally impossible for someone to, to love a, a group of strangers that come together in the name of Christ while denying the love to their family. One of the first things a new Christian should do is try to heal any broken relationships with their own flesh and blood. It may not be possible, because um, that's a fact, right? You know, families have always been dysfunctional because of sin. And, and families split apart, and brothers, and, and like in, in our study of Genesis, we'll just see more and more of that as we get into, Joseph, into Jacob's family and Joseph and his brothers. And there's so much anger and so much strife and, and, and so much dysfunction. Well, that's part of the world that, because that's what sin does. And, and, and so when you become a Christian and you become part of the, the faith family of Christ 
And, and as you're loving your, your, your new brothers and sisters in Christ and they're loving you, one of the things should be that, well, you know, I, I don't hang out with my parents. They're pagans. Um, and they don't like it that I go to church here, etc. Uh, the word of God just says love them. Care for them. Continue to do good to them because they are of your own flesh and blood. And, and so you, gotta, uh, you, you have to do this. Um, in verse 8, that phrase, uh, for his own, it's purposely vague and dis- indistinct. It, it speaks of ants and uncles, you know, not ants like in the insects, but Aunt Bertha. Um, so ants and uncles, it, it's talking about family members, people that you're related to, anyone in your extended family that may need help. And then it says, and especially for his own family, such a person who, who doesn't care for his own is worse than an unbeliever. Brothers and sisters, many, many unbelievers have broken and dysfunctional families. That's why Jesus said that. And I just, uh, I'm thankful, you know, Adley, we, we sang that song. I think it's from John 13, 15, maybe. Um, but they will know that you are my disciples by your love. When you love one another as I have loved you, the world will know that you are my disciples. Why? Because that is such a crazy thing. Because in sin, apart from God, apart from Christ, apart from a relationship with Christ, we're all struggling to love. We all know, because there's, everybody has that voice of truth in them, we all have a conscience, we all know that our family The family is the tightest unit. We're the same flesh and blood, but yet it's so hard for us to get along. And so when they see the church not just loving their own, but also loving these strangers that come together in the name of Christ, loving them like brothers and sisters, forgiving them, and being forgiven by them, when the world sees that, they're seeing something that they don't see. And they know it, and they understand it. So, even unbelievers know that they're responsible for the care of their family. And, and think about it, brothers and sisters. If this was not true, the world would be even worse than it is. If families didn't take care of families, even apart from Christ, how bad would the world be if every family just basically shattered after the children were growing up a little bit? If every family just shattered and, and every family was broken, and no families would take care of each other. But that's why the Apostle Paul is saying what he's saying. This man is worse than, than, than an unbeliever because even the unbelievers know that they're supposed to take care of their family. And so how can it be that a Christian who confesses Christ and has this new family is denying his own family? Even animals, for the most part, care for their families. Brothers and sisters, even those who don't know God understand what the phrase dysfunctional family means. Think about that. If you say dysfunctional family, everybody on the planet knows what you're talking about, at least if you're talking their language, right? Dysfunctional family, everybody knows what that means automatically. They understand that term. They may never have been in a church in their entire life, but they automatically know what a dysfunctional family is. And they understand why it's called dysfunctional family. Because they understand there's, there's a knowledge that's given to us. Enough knowledge to know that a family should love each other. We should care for each other. We should protect each other. We should have each other's backs. There's nobody in the world that's as close to you physically, mentally, genetically, than your own physical family. And everybody knows that families are dysfunctional everywhere, but they know that that's not the way it should be. And so the church and the Christian has a testimony. And so if you're working with somebody at a job and they know you're a good church-going person, but they also know you can't stand your mom and dad and that you don't get along with your brother and, and, and you know, you found out your other brother needed some help and, and you're just like, that guy's always been a jerk to me. I'm not going to help him out, etc. But you're a good member, a good upstanding member of your local congregation. No, doesn't work. Christianity begins in the individual heart. 
And then it expands out to care better for our spouses. You know, one of the things that will come out of uh, the book of Genesis and, and what we're looking at with Jacob, and especially in this next portion, um, this man as a shepherd was unparalleled. Day and night, he's out with his flock. And, and it's really pointing us to the idea of Christ and how he cares for us. But, but Jacob himself, when it came to his own wives and all his children, was a dysfunctional father. Christianity, brothers and sisters, should make us better spouses, better husbands, better wives, better sons, better daughters, better mothers, better fathers. Because now we have the living God who is the one who created us and designed us and built us for these functions, now teaching us, instructing us through his spirit and through his word in the name of Jesus Christ. And, and, and so we should be better at loving our own as well as each other. So it expands out to care better for our spouses, our children, our parents, and then it continues to expand from there. But when a woman is truly a widow and alone and a Christian, then the church has a calling from Christ to care for her. We have a calling. We have a mission. We have a commandment to take care of this woman. But there are also some other things that need to be evaluated once we determine that the woman is indeed alone and indeed a Christian. In verse 9, and I'm just going to start this and then I'll, uh, I'm going to be done. Do not let a widow under 60 years old be taken into the number. Let's just talk about that for a moment. What is the number or the list that we see here? Do not let a widow under 60, year old, 60 years old be taken into the number. And, and, I, and I believe that there was a group uh, in the early church uh, of women who served the church. And, and they cared, and maybe they provided meals, and uh, they did different things. Because if you look at the requirement of the, of the whole thing, you know, uh, she's got to be at least 60 uh, not unless she's been the wife, she has to have been a wife, well reported for good works, brought up children, lodged strangers, washed the, the saints' feet, if she has relieved the, the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. So there's a woman, there's a, a number of women that are allowed into the number. And these are ladies that are primarily cared for by the church. The church is, is picking up their full support. The church is caring for them. The church is paying to, for, their, for their food and their upkeep. And they're older. They can't go out in the regular world and get a job in that ancient day. But these blessed Christian widows whom the church cared for, in turn, they served the church. Now I just want to go on an aside in an application. In our country today, we, we can see how far our social programs, governmental programs to help the poor, the needy, the widows, or the orphans have fallen. And, and what I mean by that is, is that if you go back to when we started those as a nation, the, the impetus behind it was the idea of Christianity, that we're supposed to care for the poor, uh, for the widow. And, and so many of those that are, were in, in government service were Christians, and they would get these bills to help take care of this. But somewhere along the line, they changed it. So Christianity has always been about healing the broken so that we could serve God and serve our neighbor. Government programs to help do not require anything from you except that you qualify according to their standards. And, and their standards have nothing to do with your lifestyle. They have nothing to do with your life choices. They just, you know, if you, uh, and their, their requirements are based on income and you know, there's not a lot of requirements, and so you can jump onto the rolls very easily. Welfare, aid for dependent mothers, food stamps, etc. these are given out without requirement for anything on your part. That's why we in the flesh prefer them to the church. Because the government that gives, um, without even hardly looking at you, is much preferred to dealing with the church that always has a face, Right? Because the church always has a face. We always have brothers and sisters. We always have people that we know. And, and, and if, if we're caring for widows and stuff, and especially like in the, ancient, in the old church, they were among the number. 
um, people knew that they were helping to care for them. They also knew that those ladies were helping to care for us. So in our flesh, in our brokenness, in our ungodliness, we prefer government programs because they don't want anything from us. They don't ask for anything. They don't require anything. They just give us money. But here's the problem. That's actually dehumanizing. The church is helping in Christ to bring us to a knowledge of Christ, to bring us to a knowledge of the image of God and how we might walk in that image of God. And the image of God requires responsibility that I love and care for others even as I am loved and cared for. Government programs that just give money and don't require anything are actually dehumanizing these people. They're not helping them up. They're actually pushing them down because any, I don't care who you are, if you start getting a stream of easy money coming your way, there's a lot of Christians that if somebody's gonna send me free money, I'm not gonna send it back. I'm not gonna give it all away, right? A lot of Christians will say, well, I could use that, yeah, right? We were and are meant to serve God and our neighbor. And when by God's grace we are healed by the gospel and the spirit, and we begin to do the work or the service of God, there's a sense of blessing. There's a sense of assurance. There's a sense of belonging. Right? That we have a, we talk about this all the time, you know, you know humans look for a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. And the reason is, is because we were created with a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose. A sense of meaning and purpose that can only be fulfilled with having a relationship with the living God and beginning to do what he calls us to do. And widows are included in that. These faceless government programs tear down and destroy the image of God even further than it was. If you go into the neighborhoods where, where they're collecting this, they're filled with families with no fathers. They're filled with children that are left alone most days. Maybe their mothers are off doing this or doing that, or maybe they have a part-time job or whatever, but, but the children are growing up without parents. They're growing up without boundaries. They're growing up, it's just a terrible lifestyle, and, there's, and, and the statistics on the crime and, and, and the brokenness that come out of that, it's just horrifying. That's not what the church is about. The church helps, it gives, and it's gracious. But it's also calling people to stand up. And the church says, we'll help you out because Jesus goes to the helpless, to the fallen, to the broken, to the hurting, and he helps them up. That's the whole idea. He helps them up, and then he says, come, follow me. And to follow Christ means to begin to do good works. And so when widows are truly defined as widows, according to the church, that they are alone, they don't have a family to take care of them, and, and they are Christian ladies, and the church has this responsibility to care for them, then the Word of God always also says to the widows, we want you to do something too. We want you to pray for the church. We, we, we want you to look around in, in the congregation and if there's people that, can, that need help or whatever, please lend a hand. And the child of God, the, the, the widow who is truly a child of God, wants to do that because she's part of this family. And if you're part of a family, you don't just sit there like a baby and take everything. As you're healed in Christ, you begin to actually contribute. And so these widows who couldn't go out and get jobs and now have become part of the, 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 the responsibility and, and the care of the church are also doing something very valuable for us. They're praying for us. They're caring for us in different ways. And they're contributing. They're not just takers, they're givers. Why? Because they're part of Christ, and that's what you do if you're part of Christ. You love others even as you have been loved. You give as you have been given to. And it's not just widows that are called to do this. We're all called to do this. 
a widow that is among the number that the church supports, who serves and cares for her fellow saints, is a great, great blessing and encouragement um, to all the church and is a joy to her Lord and an encouragement to her fellow church members. Amen. Father, once again, we come before you this evening hour. And again, we thank you for this beautiful day, and we thank you for the church, and we thank you for the healing. And, and we know, too, that so many times that when Jesus was going around, that when he healed people, he enabled them to go and to begin to serve. And we even think of uh, Peter's mother-in-law who was sick when he came home on a, on a, on a, on a Sabbath evening, and, uh, and she was sick and, and on, on her bed with a fever, and, and he touched her and healed her, and she got up and she served them. That was a blessing to her to be able to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, that is the greatest blessing that we're given to us, that we might be healed and strengthened in such a way that we might serve you. That, and, and we serve you, Father, by serving our brothers and sisters, our fellow saints in the Lord Jesus Christ, but also, if that's, if that's being cared for, we're also called to reach outside these walls to serve our neighbors, to serve our communities, and to do good in your name. Father, so that we might all be a testimony that we are indeed the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we love one another even as you have loved us, and that the world would see something different in us. They would see a people who not only just love and take responsibility for their own families, but they love and take responsibility for their brothers and sisters and, saint, and fellow saints in, in, in the local church, but they also take responsibility and, and care for those people around them, perhaps at work or at school. Father, give us a heart and a mind to truly serve you as people that are healed and strengthened and encouraged in the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and be with our widows. Be with those that are on the edges that have no voice and may it be that in the church and in our congregation too that they would have a voice that we would hear them that we would see them and that they would know that they are beloved that they are mothers and sisters to all of us blessed be your holy name father and blessed be your word and your spirit in the name of our lord jesus christ all these things we ask in jesus name alone amen we'll continue to worship and uh we'll sing all the